all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fawson. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at legalhelpforveterans.com. Contact us if you'd like to be a sponsor on Veterans Radio, and let's move on to our program. We want to welcome back to Veterans Radio, James Barber. James is the off-duty editor at Military.com, and we're glad to have him back to talk about that intersection of art and entertainment and the military. James, welcome back to Veterans Radio. Thank you. I always enjoy talking to you, Jim. Well, we always get an interesting look uh, from you about what's going on in the entertainment world as it intersects with uh, the military, and I thought maybe where we'd start um, is... There are some uh, military movies coming out in 2022. Some of them are out. Uh, some of them are still coming out. Uh, why don't you talk to us what we should be anticipating? Well, let's have a rerun from our conversation last year. So the biggest military movie we're waiting for in 2022 is still Top Gun Maverick. Um, we've been waiting for years. And <laughs> that movie's had, I think it's on its sixth official release date now, but it, we're looking at Memorial Day weekend now. And um, I know a few people have seen it. A lot of us are dying to see it. There are a lot of promises about the quality of the air battle scenes and the camera technology they use to capture those scenes. So um, it, at the very least, I'm expecting a very spectacular looking movie um, I'm not sure how you tell the story of Captain Pete Mitchell 30 years on. It's hard to believe he's still affiliated with Top Gun, um, but it is a it is a fictional movie. So we'll see what happened to Tom Cruise and Pete Mitchell um, Maverick sometime later this spring. It's always hard to take an icon and resurrect it, and, and particularly one, as you say, three decades later, we're going to give you a sequel. I'm not sure. We'll, but we'll see. We're looking forward to that. What, what else is out there, James, that we ought to be looking at? Well, I'm very excited about um, the director, Baz Luhrmann, has made a biography of Elvis Presley, who we all think of at Military.com as Army veteran Elvis Presley. And um, his service in Germany is a really critical moment in his life because that's where he met his future wife priscilla who was the daughter of an air force officer and even though it's a brief moment in the trailer that's out there now we do see elvis in uniform um making eyes at priscilla so i hope we'll see um that part of the story it's hard to put that man's life into a a two-hour movie but um that'll be coming this summer Um, and we get another Mission Impossible movie this fall. Um, and those are espionage movies that aren't strictly military, but, you know, many of the characters in the Mission Impossible series are veterans or military connected. And um, at least at military.com, we like to count our James Bonds and Mission Impossible spy movies as part of our coverage. So, um, Well, and we love all the gadgets, right? It's Mission Impossible absolutely. and James Bond wouldn't be, those movies wouldn't be half the fun if you didn't have all the gadgets. And that's what we all look at it. Boy, I bet that shows up somewhere in the real world. Um, also really exciting for those of us who read um, 
military thriller fiction. Um, Mark Greeny's character, The Gray Man, has finally made it to the screen after more than, than a decade. Um, the Russo brothers, who directed most of the really big Marvel movies, including Adventures Endgame, um, have made a movie with um, Chris Evans and Ryan Gosling as the Gray Man. And um, readers of those books know that this CIA operative assassin um, didn't actually serve in the military. He came up through a sort of a militia culture in Florida. Um, but most of what um, Court Gentry, the character's name, what, what Court goes through, he's dealing with former SEALs, current military people, and there's a real clash between the gray man, the character, and the military culture that he has to deal with to do his job. And when, and when are you expecting that out uh, then, James? That's gonna, that is a Netflix movie. Um, Netflix are notorious for not giving specific dates, but I would think it's going to be sometime this summer. Um, you know, to stretch it out a little bit, um, part of and it's not written about in my 12 movies to watch for, but there are a lot more military TV series, especially at, at Amazon Prime Video, that are making a big impact on what we cover. So there's already been the Reacher series this year based on the Jack Reacher novels um, by Prime Video. And then coming this summer, um, there's the Terminal List starring Chris Pratt, which is based on um, Jack Carr's novel series about former SEAL James Reese, who is a um, unstoppable killing machine who's on a mission to avenge his family. And I would think that Netflix and Prime Video are going to try to not put the Gray Man and the Terminalist out at the exact same time, but we'll both we'll see both of those this summer. Well, we've all learned to binge over uh, binge watch uh, these series over the uh, last couple of years during the pandemic's um, impact on all of us, and it's also impacted uh, sort of big budget war movies, hasn't it? Um, well, we. You know, it's hard to, to think about this because we seem to be finally coming out of it. But mostly over the last two years, when there has been filming, there have been incredibly strict safety protocols in place on movie sets. And most of those protocols involve distancing on set. And what you see is a lot of films coming out without huge crowd scenes. Um, and that really gets in the way of combat movies, obviously. And it seems like this year we aren't seeing the same number of old old fashioned war movies that we usually see in any given year because it's really been difficult or impossible to make movies like that for a while. And hopefully those times are changing and we'll get back to something more like what we're used to this year. In 2023 and 2024, we'll see war movies back in the theaters. Has it been easier to make the Netflix Prime Video sort of series rather than the you know big uh, theater war movies because of that uh, because of the limitations imposed by the pandemic well you know one movie that's come out this year that i really enjoyed and i'm i'm i guess a lot of other critics didn't agree with me but the roland emmerich movie moonfall has a lot of big epic scenery but emmerich started working he made the midway movie a couple of years ago he uses digital technology to create the backgrounds in his movies and he's able to shoot in this very sparse way and then fill it all in with the computers um so that's a big epic movie so people who can work in digital media it's definitely easier to do that right now and sometimes people don't expect as big a vista if they're watching something on television so in some ways i think it's easier to shoot a tv series than it is a movie that's going to be shown on an imax screen well, one of, one of the other movies that has come out that has uh, attracted, I don't know if it's a military crowd or, or if it's just a dog-loving lo- crowd, um, is the movie called Dog um, with Channing Tatum. Uh, g- give me your views on this one. I'm glad you brought it up because that was next on my list too. And one thing that I find really charming and moving about this film is that it's inspired by a, a movie, a documentary that Channing Tatum and his production partners made about military working dogs. And they wanted to make a more commercial, more relatable movie 
to sort of tell the story again to a broader audience. And the movie looks like a comedy and it certainly plays like a comedy most of the way through, but it's also about how a lot of combat veterans struggle with post-traumatic stress and the role that military dogs and dogs of any stripe service dog can play in helping people find their way. And, um, and in, and in a way, the character that Channing Tatum plays, a former army ranger, also helps this military dog who's suffering from post-traumatic stress find its way back to a relationship with, with other dogs and people. And it's a really moving, charming film, and I think it's done pretty well at the box office, but I know it's going to be a huge hit when it comes to home video and streaming later this year. Well, and I think it's a uh, an easy way in for some folks to maybe understand a little bit about what veterans can go through and the value of that companionship of a dog. Um, it reminds me of the book Craig and Fred by Craig Grossi. Um, and uh, again, I think it's kind of an easy way to ease somebody into understanding some of these issues as it relates to veterans and, and the special bond with uh, dogs that give them com- comfort if they've got uh, you know, a, a PTSD and the, and the dog's watching their back. So it's kind of a, a feel-good movie, I think. Well, in most movies that have been made over the past decade about post-traumatic stress are, are the opposite of that. They're very difficult, tough, trying movies to watch. And I think some of those movies need to exist. But to it's nice to see an entertainment that addresses these issues as well. A lot has changed in the movie business uh, over the years, and and that includes more recently sort of the role of Chinese filmmaking. Um, Because you're an expert in this field and and kind of watch it and really understand that intersection between entertainment and the military for military.com, give us all a little lesson of what's going on with Chinese films. Well, this is something I've been um, I've been um, interested in Chinese action movies going back for decades. And so um, I grew up watching the Once Upon a Time in China movies, um, Jackie Chan movies. So this was sort of a, a field I was already following when there started to be a change and how Chinese mainstream films approached action movies. And starting with movies like Wolf Warrior, Wolf Warrior 2, Operation Red Sea, a few years ago, the Chinese started to portray their military as the world's policemen, as the force for good in developing countries. Um, movies where Chinese military goes to Africa and fights off um, evil businessmen or sometimes military, often they're Russian, even more often they're like corrupt American businessmen. And it's the Chinese who bring justice and to these people and these um who are less fortunate the chinese or they're helped by the chinese military and that's the message that's getting out into a lot of countries in the world that we don't see as much because these movies are in chinese they play in america with subtitles and none of them have been a hit um the most interesting which i haven't seen yet is the, the movie about the battle for chosen reservoir told from the Chinese perspective. It's, um, there's been two movies in the series released, um, Battle for Lake Shangjin. Um, your Chinese is probably better than mine, Jim. But, um, no, that, was released <laughs> la- <laughs> that was released last August and made almost a billion dollars with no real release in the United States and no home video release. Um, the sequel came out um, for Chinese New Year and didn't do quite as well, but um, these are big, epic um, you know, uh, longest day style, massive military movies about the heroics of the Chinese army against the allied forces in the Korean war. And, you know, trying to create patriotism among their Chinese audiences, trying to give their version of oral history. Um, but in a way, I think I'm, uh, these movies remind me of, American action pictures of the 80s when Sly Stallone or Chuck Norris or sometimes Bruce Willis would arm up and go around the world and make it safe for democracy. This is the same vibe, the same sort of level of sophistication, but 
the Chinese are the heroes now. Well, and, I, and I've seen a couple of these on streaming, and I couldn't even tell you what platform I've watched them on, um, whether it's Netflix or Amazon Prime or something. Um, but when I've watched him, James, and we're talking to James Barber, off-duty editor of Military.com, James, they sort of have a, a much higher propaganda feel to them uh, than I think uh, we're generally used to here in the United States, at least at least now, maybe decades well, ago. But did, did you get the same feeling that, boy, there's a lot of propaganda built into well, these movies? Well, that's why I... Um why it mentioned the eighties. I mean, you know, I think red Dawn from the eighties is one of my favorite movies of all time, but it is absolutely a priceless piece of Reagan era, pro America propaganda. Um, and these movies remind me of that vibe, which we haven't seen in American film in a long time. Um, obviously those kind of movies have Hollywood's made, um, sort of propaganda like war movies, since they started making movies. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and filmmakers around the world. Um, and these Chinese movies, to me, feel like the latest iteration of that vibe. It's just coming from a much different perspective than we have ourselves. Well, all of these movies are a great way to spend a little time and, and uh, uh, lose yourself. And, and I know on the Chinese ones, they, they do tend to be you know, big budgets, lots of action, lots of gimmicks, uh, the ones I've seen. Um, so, you know, again, it's an enjoyable uh, an enjoyable way to spend an hour or two um, as you look at uh, these different movies and see how the military is reflected uh, in entertainment. James, let me turn you, though, to maybe the future. We're talking at a time when uh, Russia is invading Ukraine, and I can't help but watch what's going on. And because we're seeing it all in a digital live format every night, it just makes you feel like you're going to, these are the seeds of the next round of movies, it seems to me. What's your reaction to that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's fascinating and challenging and also heartbreaking to watch how this particular war is unfolding on social media. This is the first TikTok war. Um, you are having civilians who are chronicling what's going on in their country in almost real time. And you or I can sit in our homes in the United States and follow this war in a way that we've never been able to follow any war before. Um, that's obviously going to motivate filmmakers. There are creative people are watching and creative people learn from reality. and you know, will we see a, the first found footage style war movie in 2025? I think the odds are really good. Someone will take, someone will tell the story of a war through pieces of information created from social media or the, the appearance of it in that style. And I think it's going to be really fascinating. Um, it's a lot different than the kind of war movies that, most of us grew up with. Um, maybe it's a lot closer to the experience that people are having now, or even closer to the actual experience that people have always had that we've never been able to see before. Well, and you kind of, you know, you see some larger than life people coming out of this Ukrainian crisis, um, not only, you know, on the, uh, uh, you know, the evil side of Putin, but the rise of President Zelensky as a is sort of hero status, for, for Ukraine, and again, I just think this fits right into somebody's got to be writing the script as we go along. Well, and it's, it's always fascinating that history creates heroes, that, you know, someone who is a, um, when a challenge rises, um, there are a lot of people who didn't like Franklin Roosevelt on December 1st, 1941, who became great supporters because of the way he led the U.S. after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, and those, I think a lot of those people would have never given Frank, um, Franklin Roosevelt credit for anything without those circumstances changing what he did and how he was perceived. Um, Zelensky was, um, it's almost as if um, Stephen Colbert was elected president of the U.S. He was a popular personality in Ukraine who had been an actor 
who became president. And I think there were people internationally who didn't take him seriously. And he's certainly um, risen to the circumstances he's found himself in. And that's a fascinating story. Yeah, absolutely. As I say, I think you're watching the, you know, maybe five years from now, but we'll be talking about the movies to watch and we'll be relating it back to this. Um, and uh, there are folks, uh, I think, uh, is it Sean Penn who's in Ukraine writing a, or filming a documentary as as the yes. war's going on? That's a little crazy as well. Even though I know a lot of people who are listening to this may not have much use for Sean Penn's politics, but he is a the rare Hollywood actor who has taken his success and his wealth, and he spent a lot of time in Haiti over the last decade um, on the ground. He hasn't been making as many movies because he's been an activist on behalf of people whose lives were destroyed by an earthquake. He sees these people's lives destroyed by war. I'll be very fascinated to see what he comes away with and what his perspective is whether I agree with him or not with where he comes out. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not so much about his, uh, as you say, his politics, but that we're in a time where somebody can go and does go uh, while it's, while it's going on and create knowing that this is history. That's got to be captured. I'm creating the documentary now, not five years from now. You know, he has to be inspired by John Houston and John Ford, um, joining the Navy in World War II and going out and making those incredible documentaries that were shot in real time by real filmmakers. We And again, weird times we're in because of the social media. I can't remember which action hero it is, but somewhere uh, I saw in social media that they had to put out that, and I don't remember if it's Sylvester Stallone or somebody else, who was not fighting for... Oh, uh, you bring it up. I, I wrote about this. Well, oh, yeah, Steven tell Seagal, me. This is crazy. Go ahead, explain Steven, it. Steven Seagal has been pals with Vladimir Putin for several years now and is actually an honorary. I don't let's, I think we have to go past that. I think he's actually a Russian citizen traveling on a Russian passport now. Um, spent a lot of time in Moscow, has a place there. And someone thought it would be funny taking these facts that I just mentioned and say, oh, Seagal's on the ground with the Russian military invading Ukraine. And that's not true, but um, the podcaster Joe Rogan saw this, reposted it as if it were true. And social media, of course, as it does, exploded. And um, Rogan had to retract it. Um, Steven Seagal is not fighting on the front lines. I, um, if you've seen any of his movies the last few years, he usually waddles across the screen for about five <laughs> minutes. Yeah. Um, he, um, but you know, that there's this sense there's such a distortion field through social media. Some people thought it was actually possible that Steven Seagal, the man that he is was on the ground fighting a war on behalf of his friend Vladimir Putin. It's just crazy this intersection of entertainment and, and real life and military life, if you will. Um, as I'm watching this unfold in Ukraine and I'm hearing about recently the Ukraine standing up a digital self defense corps to attack uh, Russia with, uh, you know, internet. Uh, uh, viruses and what have you. Again, I'm, I'm watching that and I'm thinking, James Barber's got to be thinking, well, that's going to be the plot of the next one of these next movies I have to review for military.com. It, 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 and, and I'm also watching, I, I'm thinking about everyday Russians who have no real politics or no interest in this, who are being cut off from their computers, they're being cut off from all the movies they were expecting to see. We all could go see the Batman this past weekend, and you can't go see it if you're a Russian. Um, that's a, that's a it's probably a legitimate consequence, but um, it it, hi- it exit- highlights the interconnection between you know all all of this connectivity that you get through the internet and entertainment and streaming platforms and digital versions of everything. I mean, it's just um, uh, a lot more connected than maybe we all thought. 
who, who would have imagined 20 years ago that that entertainment could be weaponized in this way as um, you know back in the day when everyone had to ship film reels to another country they would have been there months ago and now that everything is is shown digitally in all these theaters around the world it's just a computer file they can cut off access to and pull a movie two days before it's supposed to release well, it gives us a lot to think about, and we're glad, uh, James Barber, off-duty editor for Military.com, that you came back to talk to us a little bit about what's going on here in 2022. Uh, a strange time because of the coming out of the pandemic, but also strange times because we find ourselves with the Ukraine-Russian war going on. And we really appreciate you giving us some thoughts as to that intersection between uh, military and entertainment. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our... National sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, NVBDC.org, Eisenhower Center, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan, VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. They keep us on the air, as does your support. Go to Facebook, go to veteransradio.net, and support our efforts. And until next time, you are dismissed. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.